Okay. Dick. It's morning again in America. Today, more men and women will go to work than ever before in our country's history. With interest rates at about half the record highs of 1980, nearly 2,000 families today will buy new homes, more than at any time in the past four years. This afternoon, 6,500 young men and women will be married. And with inflation at less than half of what it was just four years ago, they can look forward with confidence to the future. It's morning again in America. And under the leadership of President Reagan, our country is prouder and stronger and better. Why would we ever want to return to where we were less than four short years ago? All right, everyone. I am here with John Muir, um, who is here to talk to me about the idea of the underlying uh, subtext of conservative ideology in horror movies of the 1980s, whether purposely or not. Um, you know, the kind of connection that that is, um, you know, as uh, Goddard once said, film is not a reflection of reality, but rather a reality of reflection. Um, mm -hmm. So we were looking to kind of discuss that and uh, kind of in, in its nature. But before we kind of get rolling on that here, um, as I start all these interviews off, uh, John, could you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, well, first, I want to say, John, thank you for inviting me to be on with you and to discuss this topic. Uh, I'm the author of um, a lot of books about horror films. I, I, I never say I'm a famous author, but I say if anybody knows my name, it's probably because I write about horror movies. <laughs> if they like horror movies, maybe they know who I am. Maybe I'm lucky enough to be known by some people for that. But some of the books I've written are horror films of the 1970s, horror films of the 1980s, horror films of the 1990s, and horror films of the 2000s will be coming out early in 2022. And I'm currently working on horror films of the 2010s. Uh, I'm also the creator of a, a web series, The House Between, that ran from 2007 to 2009, and it, it sort of bridges science fiction, horror, maybe to some degree fantasy, and, and we're working on uh, like bringing that back as an audio production right now. We've recorded the first season of that, and uh, we'll be working on the second season of uh, The House Between. And yeah, as we were um, just kind of, or rather I was discussing there at the top, um, you know, I've always been fascinated how films are a reflection of their times, whether purposeful or not. So, so do you feel that um, there is kind of an underlying subtext of slasher movies having a connection, even though the conservative movement, the evangelical movement were so against these films that they kind of accidentally made strange bedfellows? Right. No, I mean, uh, first of all, I want to say I like what you said, because I, I do think that there are sort of grades of um, intention in terms of movies and you know a lot of times there are artists who create these films who have a message they want to convey and a viewpoint they want to convey whether uh one side of political affiliation or the other whether you know one side of the spectrum or another and then sometimes i think there is sort of this osmosis of the culture or the zeitgeist where you can find those statements and ideas there, but they may not have been um, as overtly intentional, perhaps, um, as in other cases. And, and then, of course, they're just like the bad movies, which are aping other movies that have that kind of uh, viewpoint. So, you know, we had so many slasher movies in the 1980s, you know, great ones, mediocre ones and bad ones. And, and they all did seem to adopt a certain viewpoint or ideology and so you know then the question kind of becomes um you know what does art do and part of the part of art is us filling in the gaps so maybe we we see and process that intentional message or it's sort of in the water and, and we get it through you know sort of the culture or in some cases it's just, it's just like they're ripped off through something else um you know, in, in terms of the slasher movies, I, you know, I think they're fascinating because everybody hated them, uh, which is really interesting. You know, they are probably until torture porn in the 2000s, probably the most hated type of horror movie ever made. 
at least by the um you know the by intellectuals you know and and, and including of, of course film critics so you know to be clear as you said conservative intellectuals hated slasher films um on the other end of the political spectrum also the more um progressive liberal and they also hated slasher films so it's like they everyone was united in hating it and hating this format of films if you think about it and you know and, and what the slasher movies presented you know, I, I don't know if you want to call it conservative. I mean, it, it, it all depends on definitions and our definitions are always changing, but it certainly had this sort of Old Testament, let's say, view of morality. And in my book, Horror Films of the 1980s, I talk about that as sort of like vice preceding uh, slice and dice that, you know, before the people are killed, um, they, they transgress against like sort of a moral code. And, and what that inevitably comes down to because of the characters in the film is you know they, they they smoke weed or they have premarital sex you know and then they get killed it's like that act gets them killed and again too if you think about how the slashers are set up there's also this sort of old testament idea of um the sins of the father are passed to the children because a lot of slasher movies begin with like this crime in the past like 10 years ago 20 years ago or whatever that kind of create this force for revenge, and then that's visited on a new younger group of people. In, in other words, the counselors in you know 1980s Friday the 13th movie, they didn't actually uh, cause Jason to drown, <laughs> right? But they are paying for the sins of the counselors who did. So that's also sort of an Old Testament view. So I, that's a very long-winded answer, but yeah. yeah so I, I mean, you know, it, it's very interesting, and you can, you know, we can we can talk more about you know what I see there. But I mean, I certainly see that sort of Old Testament view as, as being evidenced in, in, in the horror films of the 80s, the slasher films. Yeah, no, no. Thank you very much there on that. Um, and I will actually, you know, hit on a couple of things you mentioned there, because actually those were a few of word for word of my notes here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I did think that, you know, it's interesting that in 19, you know, in the 1980s, you know, we could actually go back like two years earlier, you know, in 1978, you know, not literally, but hyperbolically, a lot of people said that, you know, Halloween, not really the first slasher, but the first one of, of right. big note um, kind of was, you know, hyperbolically kind of the end of the sexual revolution and kind of introduced more of a, you know, whether purposely or not, kind of more of a conservative ideology in the in these horror movies, as you mentioned, you know, the vice leads to the slice. Um, <laughs> and so was that kind of the, uh, the beginning of that and uh, making of a natural partnership? Well, I think that you know, you almost have to look at the 60s, 70s, and 80s together. You know, the 60s being the rise of the counterculture and, you know, this movement away, especially in the late 60s, towards more, you know, conservative pillars. You know, we were, a lot of people were questioning the war in Vietnam in the late 60s, uh, you know, women's lib, things like that. And, and the 70s is what m my friend uh, who, who passed away in 2008, Johnny Byrne, who was story editor on Space 1999 and uh, worked on Doctor Who and things like that. He, he always called the 70s like the wake up from the hippie dream. And, and so the 70s is like this transitional period where we, we have this new freedom in the cinema to show things, but we're also having sort of reactive cinema to um, events of the 60s. And then, you know, in the 80s, it's just like hardcore um, reaction to the 60s and 70s. You know, my, my dad always says, you know, John, the pendulum always swings politically. You know, we, we swing to the left and then we swing to the right, you know, and it, and it always sort of goes back and forth. And if you look at like from the 60s, you know, to the 80s, you know, you just, you just see that, you know, you see the country sort of swinging left and then sort of not knowing exactly where it is in the middle and then swinging to the right in, in the 80s. So Halloween in 1970, I mean, I know John Carpenter has said that, you know, that was not intended to be sort of this Old Testament thing, um, you know, as far as, you know, uh, promiscuity is punished and things like that. You know, and Halloween is an interesting case because that white mask that Michael Myers wears, we, we can impose sort of anything on that that's in us. As I said, like part of art is our interpretation of it and our reading of it. And 
you know, so it could be that he's just a developmentally, uh, you know, arrested kid playing Halloween games, you know, against a group of, you know, young people, babysitters primarily. Um, you know, some people have seen him for sure as the symbol of like um, the id, uh, the mo- uh, like a monster from the id, um, Lori's id, and, and her being sort of repressed and, and, and him sort of taking that out in his actions and killing Annie and so forth. So, I mean, I, I think, again, I think that reading is absolutely possible. And I think, again, if, you know, we're trying to, you know, sort of see what was in the water at the time, I mean, I, I think that's a sort of favorable reading to what happened, um, what was happening culturally. You know, ha- Halloween is so multifaceted. I mean, I think, you know, at some point I wrote an article, it's like the, the Tao of Michael Myers, you know, he can be interpreted in so many different, so many different ways. That white featureless mask gives us the possibility to sort of consider so many things, as opposed to somebody like Jason, you know, in the Friday the 13th movies, where inevitably Jason is accompanied by a terrible storm or, or even his mom, I think in the, in the, in the first one as well. Like it's almost like na- super nature God, if you want, is like giving them cover to enact this old Testament, um, you know, justice upon, you know, people who have, you know, strayed from the path. I, I don't see that so much, so much at Halloween. I, I, I don't, I don't feel that that is, as powerful and a force in Halloween, but I see why people saw that. And maybe, you know, uh, good, good art. I mean, you know, imitation is what the sincerest form of flattery, right? So, you know, so maybe somebody looking at Halloween said, you know, that was a great movie. And I, and I, 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 I pick out that vibe from maybe, you know, the 10 important things in that movie. And now I'm going to go make Friday the 13th and I'm pulling that vibe in and that becomes the central vibe in my movie. I mean, I'm not saying that's what happened, but you know, I, I see fr- the Friday the 13th films, you know, and if we go into rubber reality, I know they're not technically slasher films, you know, even the Freddy films as being a little bit more that way, because certainly the sins of the father being visited upon the children is very evident in um, A Nightmare on Elm Street. But but, but I mean, I do, I do think Halloween was there and it's like the right point historically to, to be looking at that. Again, long-winded answer. <laughs> no, no, thanks. Yeah, it, and I actually have in here, you know, um, the, the sins of the father being in the next question here being visited upon the children, you know, and, and you know, we just mentioned Jason and Freddie, you know, Jason could be seen almost kind of as an avatar uh, of, of punishment and everything, but right. Freddie almost is literally bringing the sins of the child, you know, upon, you know, the parent and the idea that well, maybe a lot of these parents grew up in the early mid sixties, you know, maybe the, the flower children, the free love right. and everything like that. And now, they're being punished through their children now that you know they are uh you know they give it into the whole yuppie suburban lifestyle and the kids are kind of almost facing the repercussions from you know freddy krueger who could almost be thought of as as a very abstract stand-in for for ronald reagan (laughs) and even right right and and, you know and and i did say that at some point i you know i i think i write that in horror films of the 80s and i mentioned it in a documentary and I, and I know i caught a lot of um guff for that i mean i'm not saying that ronald reagan was a killer or anything you know i'm not saying he was a slasher but yeah definitely i mean um you know horror movies sort of work in that way you know even as recently as halloween kills and and you know what that movie is about uh, uh i watched it last night i thought wow you know an, another sort of slasher movie that's you know fiercely of this moment uh, and, and reacting to, you know, the things happening in our culture. I, I mean, that's just always the way movies work, sort of no, no matter who the dominant person in the culture is, if it was Ronald Reagan or it was Bill Clinton or it was George W. Bush or, you know, Donald Trump or wh- wh- whomever, you know, the, the, the culture reacts both positively and negatively to that person's influence. And they're usually, um, because of the way our country works, you know, they're usually at the center of some kind of movement. I mean, certainly, you know, that is not a controversial statement. If you look at, I mean, it was literally called the Reagan revolution in the eighties. Right. (laughs) So yeah, absolutely. I I, I agree with everything you said. Yeah. And we're, uh, you know, at at this time we're living in, you know, in an era of uh, just say no and, you know, wait till marriage for sex and, you know, and the fear of the, the AIDS crisis, you know, mounting, you know, throughout the entire decade, um, you know, and then you see the, these characters in the, these films kind of like spitting in the face of, you know, that kind of ideology, right. um, and, you know, and then they, they ended up 
paying for it. You know, Jason comes for them to make them pay for the price or any of these type of movies. So, right. you know, you can't help but feel that there's some kind of reflection of, you know, you, you know, you do drugs, you have premarital sex, you have anything that used to be the way that we used to look at the old ideology, you're going to pay for it. Right. Right. I mean, I, th- I think it's this very, again, old Testament idea um, completely that these are avatars of the supernatural, um, you know, again, and somehow they marshal forces outside of nature. Even though if you look at how Friday the 13th looks, it's very naturalistic. But, but again, you have to like, you have to account for the fact that like nature always sort of supports Jason or, or his mother and, and, and kind of gives them cover, you know, through terrible storms and the power goes, yeah, you know, it's like, it's like, yeah, he, he, he's an acting revenge, but who's, who's the invisible hand there that's, uh, <laughs> you know, cutting the power and bringing the, the hurricane in or what have you. Uh, so, I mean, I, th- I think that's very interesting. And I think your reading is exactly right. It's this restoration or it's the rest the restoration of the old order or the reaction to the more recent sort of order of the ni- late 1960s, early 1970s, for sure. And what credence do you give the idea of that most of these characters in these films, except for say like, you know, the final girl or occasionally maybe one other character, um, those are the only ones that have any type of personality that we get to know or you know have any understanding of. And everybody else is kind of just a disposable person, you know. And so, it, you know, if we see them just as drug addicts and and, and you know promiscuous people, right. then we don't have to to think about them being murderous people. They're just disposable bodies of you know. Well, you you know you reap what you sow. So right. Think. No, I you, you're exactly right. I mean, I think in my book I call them the victim pool when I'm talking about you know the slasher movie paradigm, and I, you know they're and I call them off the shelf characters because they are we recognize them not through any particular um, characterization flourish that's in the script or that's even really brought out by the performers, but by the types. You know, it's it's the the jock, the practical joker, the the cheerleader. You know, things like that they are definitely off the shelf characters who, who are there to sort of be punished for their transgression. But I, I also think that, you know, and ultimately that's why I think, you know, slasher movies are not misogynistic in any way and, and actually very sort of pro woman is that they're part of the world of the final girl. And the final girl was raised in that world of the cheerleader, the jock the practical joker and she has uh an insight an understanding a focus that they don't have she's the only one who's able to reckon with um the fact that something's wrong she usually she usually knows early something is wrong but doesn't know exactly what it is you know, and and then and then of course she does find out and and then fights back against it. And, and I mean, if you look at the progression of that, you know, in the slasher films, it's really quite amazing. You know, Laurie Strode puts up a a great fight against Michael Myers, but it, it, it's sort of on the run. She goes to the to her friend's house there and you know, sees he, he staged, you know, Halloween for her and, you know, stabs her and, and she's in the fight and she comports herself really well, like brilliantly well. But then it, like you go ahead another couple of years and you get to something like Wes Craven's A Nightmare on Elm Street. And there Nancy figures out who Freddie is. She gets like a self-defense book, like arranges booby traps. Like she, she, she goes on the offensive. She goes after him. Uh, you know, and, and so again, you see this sort of development of this character, but they're always surrounded by like the people who are sort of less aware, uh, less focused, are, are, are more in the moment, like worried about who's dating whom, you know, are we having a party, you know, they, what, what, what are we doing, you know, stuff like that. You know, the, the, the final girl is sort of able to see outside that, um, 
that world and and have a sense of of what the possible is that something so outrageous and out of the norm like a jason or a freddy or a michael myers you know could exist and could be dangerous so i mean i do think those characters are disposable in that sense they're types they're meant again if you're looking at this as if you're looking at this as a morality play as an old testament morality play they're the ones who don't get it for sure they, they don't get how they've been cast and in life you know on that note like uh speaking specifically on you know on the drug end of things you know the whole you know just say no program in the 80s and and suddenly you know the the fear went from kind of like hey you know let's experiment tune in turn on drop out i think i might have misquoted that you know from the 60s (laughs) to you know let's be absolutely terrified of drugs and and they're the, the worst thing imaginable and a lot of these films very early on like drug use was in a lot of ways just suggested or just a little bit of pot but as the war on drugs escalated so did the the drug use in these movies and then right. also the the more severe the price for people that would either sell or, or use drugs in these movies whether that be cocaine acid or you know or more excessive use of marijuana right right i know i, I was saying the same thing because i remember I was, I was thinking back i've got i've got my horror films of the 80s right next to me and i i, I wish i'd i, I don't know because i remember at some point it was like the, the, there was like cocaine and the slasher movies like wow they're going to like you know harder stuff at this point and it's like i don't know if that's because they needed to shock more or because they were trying to you know uh make a bigger point about uh drug use but certainly the, the slasher movies echo that uh that belief that if you transgress you will pay that uh you know there is a uh there is a reckoning if you sort of go against what the culture is now saying is the order of things for sure and one thing that's so interesting about these movies is with the you know occasional exception like you know Nancy and in in Nightmare coming back for part three, is that you almost get always a new crop of uh, victims for lack of a better <laughs> term. You know, and the and the only people that return are are Michael, Jason, Freddy, uh, you know, Pinhead, what have you. Um, right. So that almost they become whether actually or you know more metaphorically the the hero of the project they're the only ones that return movie to movie and kind of whether it's intentional or not they almost become uh just a symbol of uh authority and morality in these things because they're kind of accidentally a protagonist because they are the only one that you're going to see in each movie you know movie to movie right no, I mean, that's really true because we, my, my family, my son is 15 and uh, last night, uh, uh, my wife, my son, and I, we watched Halloween Kills and then we went out for a walk around the neighborhood because it was dark. So let's go out and be scared and walk around our neighborhood <laughs> in the dark, see if we see any, anyone wearing a white mask. <laughs> it wasn't Halloween. So, but still we, we went in and we did that. And we were walking around, we were talking about it. And uh, at some point um, it came up the idea, well, why do we keep making you know, Michael movies or Jason movies or Frame. And I said, you know, they are. I said, well, why do why do we still have, you know, Dracula movies? I mean, you know, Dracula's been around, you know, a hundred years. And, you know, Freddie, Michael, and Jason, to some extent, still have currency for us. Uh, but you're absolutely right. They 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 become the centerpieces of the story. You know, whenever you reboot um or create a sequel or, or whatever, you know, I, mean, I don't know, maybe there's a 50, 50 chance that, you know, a, a protagonist will come back, but you know, it's a hundred percent chance that, you know, Michael's going to come back or Chucky or whoever, you know, that, that they're going to be back because you need them to galvanize the action. I, I think that's one of those things though, that is more like, um, you know, literally the nature of the beast, which is, that that is how the movies are organized. I don't think that's necessarily a statement, you know, against women. I think as, as maybe some people have thought that, you know, because, because even, you know, so yeah, so Freddie, you know, N- Nancy turns her back on him. And then we have a, we do have a male protagonist in um, Freddie's revenge, but then, you know, Nancy comes back and then we have um, Kristen, 
uh is that her name uh in one of the dream warriors i can't i can't remember her name uh that's yeah that sounds right <laughs> trish arquette played her right yeah. and then and then so right but and then it was um and then it was alice who was the dream master and 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 it's and it's still sort of powerful smart women who are taking on freddy you know the, the mantle does pass that's true but I, th I think that's the nature of the beast it's like you you can't bring nancy back and like what she's defeated freddy what's the movie about then if you know if nancy comes back and freddy doesn't right so freddy has to come back you know so i think that's sort of one of those unintentional things that you can read as sort of being uh you know anti-woman but it but is not i mean you, you need that galvanizing threat that's what people are paying to see but if you look at a nightmare on elm street for the dream master what that movie is about is the process of becoming of a young woman coming into herself and and learning how to be powerful and stand up for herself i mean you can't ask for a movie more about like individual agency than that so yeah Fre freddie comes back and and he's kind of the center of it but but look at what the story is about that final girl and the, and the journey she takes so i i totally see why you know people would say well, it's like you know the the constant here is michael or freddie or whoever but it, they're always going up against you know the next in a sequence of final girls on that note it's kind of interesting if you look at the the 80s ones as compared to say the 90s ones you know if you ask people who is the uh you know the main character in nightmare on elm street you might get some nancy but you're mostly going to get freddie that's what most people on the street would say but if you ask them who is the main character of scream they might not necessarily say ghostface they're probably going to say sydney prescott you know so right. the idea you see a lot in the 90s that you, you see more of the the quote unquote victims returning to films and getting a, a new, um, you know, villain or new heavy, you know, in each film. So was that kind of seeing a, a, a dynamic change between the eighties as compared to the nineties? Absolutely. And one of the things that happened between the eighties and nineties was for, for one thing, there were a number of uh, horror film scholars uh, who are women who were standing up for the films and saying this is what they're doing the other thing that happened was that you know hollywood does a lot of um focus groups and things like that and they found out that the primary audience for these films into the 90s was women uh was not men uh and so scream is certainly a reflection of that uh, of sort of where the audience interest is at that point as opposed to where it was maybe in 1984. But I mean, you know, an anecdotally, I could say that uh, maybe it was true even then. I remember uh, my, you know, I was a teenager in the 80s and so was my older sister. She saw Nightmare on Elm Street before me and she came home, you know, from a date having seen that movie. And she said, this is the scariest thing ever. Uh, she totally identified with it. Um, and it, it just clearly struck a nerve with her at that age. There, there was something powerful about that story and what Nancy's journey was and the fear of Freddie. And, you know, so, so, so again, I, I mean, I, I don't see them as being anti-woman. I've, I've, I've always felt very strongly that slasher movies are not anti-woman that, that they, they, you know, that it is quite the contrary. Now, now, I always have to be careful because sometimes people make just absolutely crap movies that are, you know, just abs absolutely crap, you know, you know, lower tier, you know, garbage slasher movies where it, it, it is about like women disrobing and someone killing them. There, there are those. Yeah, I, I have to acknowledge that. But like I'm talking about like, you know, when you have somebody like, you know, Wes Craven or John Carpenter or Toby Hooper or whomever, you know, th th there's an intellect at work there that is not, um, I think, in any way sort of misogynist. And what do you think that the... Uh you know, the 80s, the decade of, of quote unquote decadence. Like, what impact do you think that, that that had on the horror genre, you know, specifically the slasher, but the genre in general? And then um, what do you think the lasting impact has been on the genre from, you know, what occurred here in the 80s? Oh, that's a deep question. I, I, I do think that um, uh, there are a couple things. The, the 80s proved that horror films are widely popular i mean we had a friday the 13th movie you know pretty much every year we had a nightmare on elm street movie every year we we started getting hellraisers and chuckies and you know all that stuff and i think hollywood said okay there, there's a real audience for this 
I also think that because of how of, of, of Halloween and Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street and where those movies sort of positioned the terror, that there also became the feeling of horror as something that is kid stuff in a way for teenagers, for high school kids. Because if you go back and you look at the 70s and you look at like The Exorcist and Jaws, um, you know, th- things like that, th- they weren't in the teenage milieu, right? Uh, so horror sort of went from being, you know, something like, you know, don't look now or the exorcist. I mean, of course you had things like the Texas chainsaw massacre and stuff where there were teenagers, but, but not, not exclusively teenagers to where we just had an absolute, like, you know, ton of teenagers in 1980s horror movies that that became the place for horror films. So that in the nineties, I think there were a lot of movements in the culture towards um moving from from getting away from that uh i think there was a reaction against the you know production values you know if you go back and read the reviews you know a a lot of people were really brutal about the friday the 13th movies and other slasher movies like where you know you get a location you get you know five good looking teens and you you know you you get a knife and you you know a rubber knife and a lot of blood (laughs) you 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 know and and there's your movie right right not necessarily true but there's some probably truth to that um and in the 90s, like, oh, no, we, we're going to have big budgets. We're going to move this out of the teenager milieu. We're going to have, you know, an A-list star fronting these things. Um, you know, so now we're going into offices and movies like The Temp, or we're going into The Family, like The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. Or, you know, that the, the horror was moving out of that teenage milieu because I think even though Hollywood said there's money to be mined here, I think there was also the feeling that there was something almost um, unrespectable uh, about, you know, not respectable about horror movies because they were all like these teenage movies. You, you know what I'm saying? So, so I, I, I think to its detriment, the '90s. Um, excuse me, my cat is meowing. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think that horror movies moved, uh, you know, to try to be more respectable, big budget things like that, and. You know, I, I wrote a book, obviously, horror films of the 1990s, and there and there are glories to be found in the 1990s. You have to look a bit harder than you do in the 1980s or 1970s, I think, and maybe even the 2000s. Uh, but I, you know, I think Hollywood was thinking, how can we make these horror movies, you know, glossier uh, and you know, tent poles for franchises and things like that. So I, I, I think the 90s. Uh, very much tried to move horror away from you know the teenage world um, while, while still trying to get you know that horror movie money for sure. And you know, just kind of lastly here, um, just to kind of you know get to kind of the title, you know, not to be you know glib here, but you know, that they when they make strange bedfellows, the title list would be strange dead fellows, just to <laughs> kind of play on words. Um, you know, <laughs> Um, if they if they made such uh, an easy partnership, whether intentionally or not, you know, is why was there such, you know, an outlash from, you know, the conservative and, and rising evangelical movement when you think that the the would have made natural allies, whether purposely or not? I, I have often wondered about that. Um, you know, I'm in my early fifties at this point. So I, I was a teenager in the eighties and sorry, my cat is meowing. <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I think because those movies are outside the norm. I th- or, or they were at that point, they, they were something new. They were showing a lot of violence they were showing drug use, they were showing nudity, things like that. And so, you know, someone who, you know, and again, I don't, I don't want to cast, you know, a, I don't want to be stereotypical about people, but I think people maybe who are more conservative, look at that and say this, like, this is, this is not who I am. Look, look at that. This is like nudity, drug use, extreme violence shown on screen. That's not my worldview. Right. And, and, and those things sort of, like flash a beacon at you in those movies so that if you're one of those people who is like 
going to sort of be ejected, be triggered by those things, you're not going to stay to pick up the nuances uh, of what the film is saying. You might not even get to the, um, you know, vice proceeds slice and dice. You might not see, you know, how nature or super nature is, you know, on the killer side. You might not get the sins of the father because all you're seeing is that very uh, surface thing, nudity, drug use, violence, blood. And, and again, I think that that is something that probably makes pe some people hit the eject button and say, I'm not going to watch this. This, you know, I, I, don't, I don't approve of this. I mean, I, I think it's the same thing. You know, again, I, I, I try to be very fair minded and, and not cast people in stereotypes. But I also I mean, the, there were a lot of feminists who at the same time did not like these films. So you talk about, you know, strange dead fellows, bed fell, you know, you had the 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 religious right and feminists agreeing that these movies are terrible for our culture. And, and I think, you know, the feminists were probably seeing the same thing. It's like, look at these women in this film being exploited and, you know, showing their breasts, you know, again, there, there's stuff there to be like, okay, I'm, I can't get past this. But if you do get past that, you can see that the characters have agency. Uh, they're smart, they're resourceful, all that kind of stuff. But again, you, you kind of have to engage with the material and, and I sometimes find that people, especially on the extreme ends of the spectrum, don't really want to engage with what's in front of them. They already have sort of a pre-existing bias, uh, no matter what your affiliation, and they can't see past that bias. So if something triggers that bias, they're out, whether it's the ultra conservative moral majority, or it's the, you know, feminist, the ultra feminist sort of on the, on the far left, so, you know, that they can't see past their, what, what they, what they brought to the movie rather than what the movie is actually depicting. Yeah. And it was a fascinating time, just a, a, a kind of a beacon of a culture war, you know, seen through the lens of a specific type of horror movie. Um, but yeah, uh, John, I can't thank you enough for coming on and, and talking with me about this. I think it's a fascinating Absolutely. topic. I think it's also one for a lot of discussion from a lot of people. So, you know, uh, dear audience, let us know what you think. Um, and um, yeah, uh, John, where uh, where can they find uh, some of your books and everything? I'm going to make sure I put those down in the in the show notes, but where can they find some of your work if they want to like look a little more further into this? Kind well, of thank you so much. So, you know, I, I, I'm i really lucky that I've been writing, you know, in the age of the internet. So, you know, Amazon has all my books, you know, films of John Carpenter, Wes Craven, The Art of Horror, uh, Eaten Alive at a Chainsaw Massacre, the films of Toby Hooper, Unseen Force, films of Sam Raimi, you know, plus all the horror film volumes I've done, uh, written a book about X-Files. So really, like, do a search on, I always say John Kenneth Muir, um, because it's not that I want to be pretentious to have my middle name in there, but there are a lot of authors who are named John Muir. Like, there's there's the famous naturalist, you know, John Muir uh, from, you know, like 100 years ago. Uh, and then there's a John Muir who repairs Volkswagens for a living and who's very popular with Volkswagen <laughs> <laughs> owners. So I say like, so I say, I got to distinguish myself. I'm the horror movie, John Muir. Right? So if you do a search on John Kenneth Muir at Amazon, you see all my books are popping up. And I hope people will take a look at horror films of the 2000s when it comes out and maybe give um, the return of uh, House Between a listen. I'm on Twitter at JK Muir. And um, my blog is reflections on film and television at blogspot.com. Awesome. Yeah. And yeah, the books are amazing. So like I said, uh, everybody, I will have those in the show notes, you know, take a look. It doesn't even hurt just to click to look and then maybe you'll find something that's intrigues you, you know, and, and pick up a copy. Um, so again, you know, a uh, fascinating topic, kind of like a, you know, one that I think will engage some debate. So um so I, John, I thank you once again so much for coming on and talk with me about it. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I, I hope that this does spark a, a great debate. I thought your questions were great. And I, I think it's always interesting to revisit culturally where we were in the 1980s and where horror was and where horror is going. Right. Thanks so much. Thank you.